Good afternoon. I'm Carol Hain. I'm a PA in the uh, Medication Assisted Treatment Program at Northern Nevada Hopes. Welcome. It's nice to see familiar names. Hello, Dr. Koss. Um, I'd like to take a minute to make introductions. Again, I'm Carol Hain, and we're going to talk about withdrawing um, from buprenorphine therapy. And um, Dr. Biondi is with um, me, and we're going to just sort of co-present that today. We'll open it up for cases um, after our introduction. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little cold today. Uh, Dr. Tracy Biondi, a uh, physician at Northern Nevada Hopes with the uh, MAT program. I'm Echo Troop. I'm a licensed clinical social worker with the MAT program at Northern Nevada Hopes. Mark Broadhead, addiction psychiatrist, VA Medical Center, Reno, Nevada. I'm Kelly Memon. I'm a licensed social worker and um, a case manager for the MAP program at Hopes. Hi, I'm Danica Pierce. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I am the MAP program coordinator at Hopes. Hello, I'm uh, Troy Jorgensen, the program coordinator here for Project Echo Nevada um, and IT support as well. So we'll go around the group here and see who we have joining us today. Uh, the first is uh, just AC90090. Um, it doesn't look like we have audio for you though. Um, I don't have control to mute or unmute you. So make sure that you click the join audio icon in the lower left corner of the Zoom screen and then we'll be able to hear you. Uh, so then let's go next to Alice. Alice, could you take yourself off mute and introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Alice Lynn. I am applying to the UNR Postback program to help with pain management in rural Nevada, especially here with everything. So I'm hoping to get into the UNR Med School program, and I found your project, and I'd like to be a part of it, if that's okay with you guys. Absolutely. Yes. We're in. You. <laughs> we accept. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then Michelle. Hi, uh, Michelle Stout. I'm up in Kodiak, Alaska. I work at the Providence Kodiak Island Medical Center here. Great to have you back today. Hi, Michelle. Michelle. <laughs> Um, and then it does look like uh, AC90090, you joined the audio. Could you introduce yourself? <laughs> this is uh, Grace Johnson. I'm on LISW here in Las Vegas with uh, Anthem Insurance. Great, great to have you back, Grace. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Farzad Kamyar. Hey guys, Farzad Kamyar, psychiatrist. And a high risk pregnancy center and MAT provider in Las Vegas. Hi, Dr. Kamiar. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good. And then is it uh, Judge Deborah Schumacher? No. Oh. Judge Schumacher, uh, I took you off mute. If you have a microphone, we should be able to hear you now. Uh, maybe you don't have a microphone. So, um, she's not talking. I can follow up with you and see other options so we can communicate with you uh, in future sessions. <coughs> and Dr. Michael Koss. Oh. Wow. Dr. Koss playing some, some old music there. Um, Allison? <coughs> Allison, are you there? Do we have audio for you today? Okay, maybe no audio for Allison today. Um, and then a 702 area code 702-228-1308. Could you introduce yourself? I took you off mute so we should be able to hear you. Yep, go ahead. Oh, I apologize. That's me again. I, for some reason, I did it wrong. Uh, is that you, Grace? Grace Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> it's my double agent. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we'll open it up right now, um, see if anybody has any cases or questions that they want to ask. Feel free to take yourself off mute or write in using the chat function if you have any, anything. We'd love to talk with you. So we'll give it a couple minutes or a minute or two here. Anybody with any 
again, any pieces, any things that they'd like to bring up that um, burning questions or concerns, thoughts about our presentations thus far? No. Okay. okay. Well, um, great. So Dr. Biondi and I are going to tag team a bit with this. Um, I'm going to give the first portion, which is really um, identical to what we presented a year ago. And then she's going to come in with um, additional information, hopefully not um, overlapping too much, but there are um, various ways to withdraw from buprenorphine therapy. And it certainly is nothing that is written in stone and it's an individualized process. So that being said, we'll jump right in. Okay, so there are different things that can come up which would um, provide a reason for people to decide, or a practitioner or the uh, individual decide that they wanted to stop buprenorphine. Um, they're, if they're deciding and planning for a pregnancy in the future and want the uh, absolute best outcome for the baby and avoidance of the um, infant uh, withdrawal syndrome, then pregnancy and lactation would be a reason to stop um, people argument. Um, we're going to discuss this in greater detail later, but um, there have been, um, in the past, ideas to stop the buprenorphine before surgery and uh, emergency or elective surgery that actually is evolving and Dr. Biondi will discuss that um, further later on. Um, sometimes the side effects of buprenorphine are intolerable. People have headaches, they have GI upset. Um, I've had individuals that have had oral ulcers from the, um, the patches. Those are reasons that uh, you'll have to taper off the uh, buprenorphine. If you have someone that comes in continuing to have other um, illicit drugs, um, methamphetamine, or even um, benzos, or if they're continuing to use or try and use um, despite uh, being on the, in, in the program, then really, you're not doing them any, any good, and that puts you at risk as well. So that would be a time that you would um, taper. Sometimes when people are done with their rehab programs, they're, they don't have any cravings, they've gone through the extensive counseling, they've had a new way to look at things, their mental health problems have been addressed um, more completely, their um, depression is being treated, they're able to deal with the um, stressors in their life, or maybe some changes have been made that um, things have resolved. Um, and in those cases where they really feel like their cravings for the drugs are, that they've been using are down, that's a good opportunity to um, consider going off the Suboxone as well. Um, a lot of times people are back in or get back to their jobs, their life, their family, really back on track. <clears throat> and they've um, gone through their recovery and they, it looks like they really can maintain their long-term recovery with, um, with counseling, with groups, with um, alterations in their, um, in their lifestyle and they've been able to internalize that. In those instances, oftentimes they do want to just get off the buprenorphine. So they don't want to be tied to their appointments, their urine drug screens, they live a distance. You know, it becomes really not worth it to have to have the cost and the inconvenience for something that they feel like maybe they don't need. Can I just mention one thing? Um, I, Carol is kind of using the, um, the term suboxone and buprenorphine right. interchangeably. And um, I just want to be sure and it's going to sound kind of basic, but just to be sure that everybody is aware that these two things are slightly different. Um, that, um, you know, and most of you may know, may know this, but just to be clear, so the Suboxone is a, is a combination drug, combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. 
that combination together is called Suboxone. And then we can also, um, we can also prescribe buprenorphine just on its own. And I won't get into the details of the reasons for that, but just to be aware that we're sort of talking about these things interchangeably and they really are sort of two different things with, with some similar features because of the buprenorphine component, which is the, um, which is the opioid component. Right. right, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, sudden, sudden <clears throat> buprenorphine. And I, again, I'm gonna say buprenorphine when it could also be the combination of buprenorphine and naloxone just for the sake of, of ease. And I'm, I won't use the Suboxone um, term, which is a brand name. And I think we kind of got used to doing that mm -hmm. a few years ago because it was really the one medication that was being used and it was the one that was, we were trying to make it more recognizable. So when I say buprenorphine, that um, doesn't imply that it's just Subutec and not Suboxone or it's the uh, combination. Okay, so if um, someone stops suddenly cold turkey, you have to remember that the withdrawal from buprenorphine lasts about a month. And that's really extensive compared to heroin. If you stop heroin, you're gonna be sick for seven days, but buprenorphine <coughs> withdrawal is uh, more protracted. Um, the initial 72 hours of the physical symptoms are um, the predominant problem, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, diaphoresis, irritability, and anxiety. And I don't want to gloss over this because it's really a significant illness. People don't tolerate this well. And it's a big, the physical symptoms are a big drive for obtaining something to make them feel better. So after the, the significant you know, um, physical symptoms, then we move into more of a, um, a more of an indolent sort of body aches and pains and poor sleep, mood swings, depression. Um, the depression really increases after a few weeks. And um, after a month, you don't have the physical symptoms, certainly, but the psychological symptoms, the depression really leads to more cravings. And in actuality, that's the um, more, most likely time that uh, relapse is um, going to occur. Next. So tapering off of um, buprenorphine, subutex, suboxone, lengthy endeavor. Um, but if you think about it, overcoming the, um, the withdrawal really is worth it in terms of um, it's, it's overcoming a, um, a withdrawal, but it's far worse to have an opioid addiction. And um, that realization that your life, what the life is like while addicted to opioids is what motivates a lot of people to continue. You know, they just get tired of their life on drugs. And that's a big, a big motivator to to, to be off of the opioids, but also to be off of the buprenorphine. And that same sort of motivation to change is what you can use to, um, to help them maintain their resolve and uh, stop the buprenorphine. Okay, so again, you know, the physical symptoms, I'm gonna just go over those a little bit more. Um, <coughs> because I did mention that people are diaphoretic, they have nausea, vomiting, and, um, but they do have hot and cold flashes. They feel profound fatigue, they ache all over. They have a sense of need, of cravings there physically, and, but also you know, they just wanna feel better and they know that they have something that will make them feel better. And so to have to go beyond that and maintain themselves is, um, is difficult. Um, they have diarrhea, poor appetite, nausea, and vomiting, they're sweating, can't sleep, they're anxious, irritable. They think about, you know, they can't continue this way. So the suicidality comes into play at that time as well. Okay, um, say you have, and you know, 
I'm just going to go through this quickly because this really doesn't um, come into play quite so much. But if um, if you had a, you know, and, and I'm going to bow to Dr. Biondi to um, elaborate on this a little bit more. When I um, had conversations with surgeons in the past who wanted the patient off of Suboxone, then um, in those instances, you could um, you could use a um, a quick detox and um, and come down off of two or three days. But now they really um, advise using either opioids or IV fentanyl. So I'm going to kind of move through that and gloss over it right now. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so sometimes, you know, and, and the surgeons have some preference as well <clears throat> and prefer, some do prefer not to have the patient. And if it's an electo surgery, you can titrate down uh, one to two weeks uh, prior to that. Mm -hmm. So um, you need to pace the overall, next slide, thanks. Overall, when you start the, the taper, you need to pace it according to the symptoms that the patient's having. Now, some people can go quite quickly, it, at least initially. When you're going from 16 milligrams a day to 8 milligrams a day to 4 milligrams, you can do that quite quickly. It's when you get down to the 2 milligrams a day where you have the opioid receptors starting to open up, then that's when um, the taper becomes quite a bit different and you have to um, and go down slowly in order to avoid the withdrawal symptoms. So um, generally dosing decreases of 25% separated by 10 days is um, what's been at least um, considered in the past to be quite tolerable. So you recall that buprenorphine has a ceiling effect and at certain doses nearly all the receptors are occupied. Each um, each um, helps induce a small effect. Cumulative effect is created when all of the receptors are, um, are covered and that's called the ceiling effect. Taking more than that ceiling dose, which is variable, but you know, I've um, found it to be about two milligrams a day and I'll, I'll um, see where other um, practitioners have found. Then above that, people don't really feel much when you're coming down. But um, once you get down to two milligrams a day, then the taper really needs to slow. Yeah, I, I just, uh, along that line, I think that's, that's absolutely right. It's really interesting to think that the, the dose that we prescribe can be variable and can be, you know, 68, 16, 24 milligrams. Um, Dr. Broadhead, I don't know if you have any thoughts or comment on that, but in terms of the, the ceiling effect in, uh, for, the, for the saturation of the new receptor, from, from what I from I've read and, and, you know, and, and what, what sort of has been borne out is that, you know, two milligrams, that's all you really need to saturate the receptors. Two milligrams? Yeah. I don't find that. Well, uh, tell us, please. Well, because 16 mil <laughs> the the research that I'm familiar with, <coughs> uh, um, which is mainly rat models, okay. is where you can get them, uh, is that uh, at 16 milligrams, uh -huh. um, that's when you get an 80% saturation of your receptors, mm -hmm. plus or minus 15%. You go up to 24, uh -huh. and then it's about 90%, plus or minus 5%. Okay. So 24 pretty much is maximum out. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, you're, you know, if you've got 16 milligrams, you're probably, that's probably what, really where you're maxing things out at. Okay. Uh, in terms of the receptor um, saturation. Uh, some people have got uh, better metabolization. Um, some people got poorer absorption. So right. the amount that you end up having to give them that they put in their mouth, uh, by the time they absorb a particular right. amount, that's then true. it's up. Uh, uh, buprenorphine is actually poorly absorbed. Right. Um, you know, it's not absorbed at all in the stomach, right. and that's why we put it in the mouth to get absorption. And if people are running late, uh, they'll take, you know, they'll take it too quickly, or they won't be very fastidious about how they take it. And so, blood levels can vary greatly um, in humans, but rats, you can pretty much give it to them. 
Right, um, okay. And so uh, the numbers for rats were around 16 to 24 milligrams. Okay. Uh, when we first started um, using it, the, you could go up to 30, 32, 36 milligrams. And okay. we've since pulled that down because now you're just wasting it. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, for me, when we get down to around four milligrams is when now you're really having to slow down. You're, you're, you have to, uh, well, first of all, it's difficult to drop 25% um, uh, or smaller doses. I prefer to actually use smaller doses at 25%. Um, but, you know, go slow, you know, stay low. Uh, you don't have to make big jumps. But when you hit four to two milligrams, now things really slow down. Uh, because it sounds strange, but their withdrawal symptoms can be just as severe uh, going from four milligrams uh, to three milligrams uh, as it was going from eight milligrams or from 16 milligrams down to eight milligrams. Um, the uh, amount you reduce is not necessarily related to the severity of the withdrawal symptoms. Kind of counterintuitive. It is yeah. counterintuitive. And once you get down to that two milligrams, then it's really using an exacto, sometimes with the films, and to really get it down the pipeline slowly. So the next slide is just, you know, sometimes it feels good just to have this <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, just to have something to kind of look at sometimes. So this, you know, where do you start? So there are so many taper schedules out there, um, but this is just one. And sometimes just having something that you can show the patient is helpful as well. And that this is over a six week period. Can I just, and, and I think at, at this point, theoretically, hopefully, if you've been working with somebody for a long period of time and their life is stable and they're ready to, to um, taper off of the medication, hopefully by that point you have a, a, a good enough relationship with that person um, that you can get honest feedback from them about what their physiological experience is as they're tapering, so that, that can kind of inform your decision making um, so that you're really getting feedback from the patient about how they're feeling and how they're managing those symptoms. Um, and so ho hopefully you're at a point where you can really do that. And don't forget, you know, typically you have eight milligram strips and you also have two milligrams. So thank goodness you can get the two milligram slowly. And I've also had people take them every other day, mm -hmm. two as a day. So, <clears throat> so this is just one. Okay. Next slide. Things to do, and I just I'm fresh off of a lady that it was um, completely detoxed, and she's <coughs> off of it now. And it was a slow, painful. Not it was much less painful than she anticipated. And a lot of times, you know, they do a lot of reading, and so they're anticipating all of these um, problems. But it's really putting the the cart before the horse, you know. So this woman in particular wanted to have. Zofran, Trioclonidine, or not even Zofran, Phenergan suppositories, but there are things that can help with the withdrawal symptoms. Um, remember when you have with buprenorphine withdrawal, you're also getting a, not precipitous, but you're getting a decline in the, um, the brain hormones, dopamine, endorphin, serotonin, GABA, and these are all chemicals that help us feel better. So look to the things that can also raise your endorphins. Um, exercise, hot showers, eating well, maintaining hydration, um, anything that can, can give you a diversion because they're not even at the, you know, there's a degree of anhedonia, you know, they're not really enjoying things, but anything that can be at least a little pleasant um, can help ameliorate these uh, withdrawal symptoms. So, um, yeah, ginseng, kava root, lemon balm, magnolia root. I can't say that um, I've tried those, but that's certainly out there, um, as well as the you know, basic NSAIDs, but the small, as I said, um, ginger ale. Are, um, and you can help with sleep, too. You can give people trazodone and doxamine to help with that. 
Cambodia. Um, get those things here. So that's pretty much where I am, and I'm going to turn it over to sure. Dr. Oh, oh, okay. Taking it, sorry. I didn't, have, I didn't have that last piece. So, um, taking it first thing in the morning is um, best because then the blood levels will be highest, and as they start to decline, then it's bedtime that uh, people hopefully can tolerate that a little bit better. Again, think about something non benzodiazepine wise that might help us. <coughs> um, you know, the focus about when the next dose is um, really is what causes a lot of angst. So if you can keep things scheduled, that helps too. You know, the thought that, well, start taking, take your pill when you start to feel your withdrawal, that just put, focuses your brain on those symptoms. Um, and just cutting the strips, as I said, using an exacto um, works. Sometimes you're going along nicely with your taper and you just reach a level where the function, they're functioning poorly, something's happening. You can stop and stay there for a while, for a few weeks, it doesn't, you know, or even going up a little bit during that time so that it's a give and take. It's not a regimented, um, prescribed withdrawal that um, doesn't take into consideration the why and where for us and the things that do vary in people's lives. So a mid-break, taper break, um, may be allowed to increase the dose to a point where withdrawals are tolerated a little bit better and then uh, return to the taper. Um, usually it's best not to have too many breaks because then it's kind of a, then the patient is looking for reasons to take more. And again, that puts the whole focus on the drug, but actually you're trying to focus on your life and other things that they can do to feel better. I think that's the last slide. Yep. Yep. So let's take a quick break there and see if anybody has any questions right now. Uh, feel free to take yourself off mute or uh, write in uh, with the chat function. So any questions out there? Hello, this is Alice. I have a really silly question because I don't know how this is done, but is there any moment where there's mood stabilizers that are prescribed concomitantly with this tapering to help with the serotonin levels or? That's right. Generally not. Now, if they've got uh, intercurrent mood problems that, that you don't think are part and parcel of the withdrawal, certainly you're going to be treating those as well. But hopefully you have sorted that out before you even start the taper. Um, hopefully you've had them on long enough where you can sort out, do they have a, a bipolar diathesis? Do they have a depressive diathesis? What have their previous withdrawals been like? Uh, but in general, uh, the anticonvulsants slash mood stabilizers have not been found to be all that effective with most of the mood symptoms um, that, that come along with withdrawal. Um, for a wide variety of reasons, um, uh, including what some of the more longer acting effects on the central nervous system are uh, from using all drugs of the all drugs of abuse. Almost everybody is going to develop an anhedonia, difficulty with concentration, um, a restlessness, and an irritability. Um, and um, medications haven't really been found to be that beneficial. Um, you may get a placebo effect because most of our folk who take pills like to take pills. And so you can get a placebo effect from giving them just about anything. Um, but for the most part, unless you think they've got an intercurrent uh, mood disorder, probably not. Um, I, having said that, I will use a lot of cl uh, clonidine um, toward the end of their tapers, even if they're on Suboxone or buprenorphine, um, uh, because there's no way to avoid uh, opiate withdrawals, even if they're on opiates. Um, and if judiciously used, and I recommend using the patch rather than pills, um, it, it can be very beneficial in helping them 
to get completely off of it. Um, and I'll keep them on it for a couple of weeks. I also do very slow tapers. Um, uh, and this is a, a matter of style rather than it is, you know, clinical exactness, you must do it this way. Um, I'm easily confused by my own thinking. And so, <laughs> so I, I never go up. And I tell them that I'm never going to go up. If we start this process, we can go down and we can stop, but we're never going to go up unless we totally change the picture of how we're treating your disorder. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of times people are pressured, well, when am I going to be off? You're going to be off when we get you off. Okay, it's a very mindfulness here and now. It doesn't matter what the future is. It's a matter of how are you doing now, which they should have embraced somewhere along the line in terms of recovery. Um, <clears throat> so that if it takes six months, it takes six months. What, you got some place to be? You know? <laughs> um, so you know, unless they do have some place to be, like prison, um, <clears throat> then I'll take a very long, slow, casual taper uh, and it also allows them to kind of forget about it they, you know after six months they got to get on with their life um, so they tend not to worry as much about it and if they've had a good uh, experience coming down um, uh, and feeling comfortable knowing that a they can stop and wait for their withdrawal symptoms to subside you know, wait for everything to catch up with them um, then there's less anticipatory anxiety about coming off <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Alice. Uh, Grace, do you have a question as well? Yes, I have two questions. Um, when you were going over the withdrawal symptoms, it mirrors one, a woman who's going through menopause. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, usually not the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but the hot flashes. And you had anxiety and those mm -hmm. I thought how do you approach that? And then the other question I have is I'm looking at um, individuals who successfully uh, detox and really want recovery, but let's say six months down the road, there's a lot of psychosocial stressors and they're really at high risk for using. Um, are they able to just get back on the, the treatment or do you have to actually relapse? I generally won't put them back on it <clears throat> um, unless uh, uh, unless there's you know a, a a unless one of two things a they're pregnant or b um, they've been to prison over it um, uh, which it, those are the same criteria for uh, starting somebody on um, uh, an opiate uh, and you don't have a dirty or, or a, or a positive urine for opiates is somebody who's gone to prison uh, in and around opiate use uh, and they're now out you can start them on methadone so I mirror the methadone um, uh, regulations on that pretty tightly um, <clears throat> if I were to put them back on I haven't had this happen yet because we had a long discussion about really do you want are you are you just trying to come home for a little bit? Is that what it is? I'll increase everything but their buprenorphine. Pull them back into intensive outpatient treatment. Get them more frequent visits with their, with their therapist. Um, have them do more recovery-oriented supportive stuff before I go to the, to the opiates. Um, simply because that's what we're trying to promote. Um, so, what about the locks? <clears throat> well, one could, <clears throat> the, 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 so one of the things you can do is, is you can just put them on an opiate blocking agent so that if they think about using, ah, it's not going to, they're not going to get uh, a high off it, so why even bother? Um, the, the, one of the problems, though, is, is that if they're having an emotional crisis at that moment, um, one of the things that, that, um, uh, Revia or um, Bivitrol can do, which are the brand names for um, naloxone, um, naltrexone, uh, naltrexone <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> uh, is that it, um, uh, it can make depressions worse, um, and there have been reported cases of suicidal ideations. Um, so 
uh, that's that's not an absolute contraindication to doing it, but that's one of the things you got to. That's one of the risks you take when you do that route. <clears throat> um, Thank you. Um, any other questions out there before we move on? So uh, I just want to say before, I, I have this slide up here because I think it's just important to sort of recognize that when you think about um, buprenorphine, you know, I tend to think of narcotics or opiates, I should say, um, in terms of potency, relative potency, and sort of morphine is like the potent, is like the one, right? Potency of one. And so then you can think about, you know, how does that compare to fentanyl? How does it compare to sufentanyl? or um, you know, um, tramadol, or whatever it might be, right? So you wanna know. So if you look at the potency of um, buprenorphine, you can see there, you know, it's approximately 25 to 50% more potent, right, compared to morphine. Um, even though it's, it's, still, it's still considered- um, 50% or 50 times? 50 times, I'm oh. sorry, 50 times. And it's still considered a partial agonist, but, but still in terms of potency itself, it's a whole lot more potent than morphine. Um, so I find that really interesting and I just thought I would just kind of throw, I, I came across that when I was looking at some research and I thought you all might be interested to sort of just be aware of that so you kind of have that in my mind. Because I tend to think about hydromorphone, how does that compare in terms of potency and all of the different opiates. And, and when I thought about buprenorphine, I thought, wh what, what's out there? You know, some say 10, some, so this is sort of one paper and they say it's 25 to 50 times. Uh, more potent than morphine. Um, and then the other thing I just, before I, I move on to the next slide, in terms of the clonidine, I think it's an interesting um, drug when you're going through withdrawal. It's, it's an alpha-2 agonist, and it was, it was discovered actually when they were giving it, so typically we use it to lower bl blood pressure. And it was first determined that um, in patients that were withdrawing from heroin that were hypertensive, they were getting this drug, and they found that, oh, what do you know? It actually mitigates some of the withdrawal symptoms. And that's how we started to first sort of use it uh, to treat withdrawal. So um, it does work and it is really important, I think, um, to, to consider these things when you're thinking about um, decreasing the dose and tapering off. Um, <clears throat> so this was, you know, um, Carol mentioned a couple of ideas in terms of tapering around surgery what to do about buprenorphine and surgery. This is a relatively um, recent paper that was published in November 2018. And I think it's sort of a continuing conundrum, right? People never know what to do. Do we stay on the buprenorphine? Do we taper it off? And although it'd be great to recommend, hey, just give them some IV, IV buprenorphine, I can tell you for sure that surgeons, internists, um, they're, not, they're not interested in doing that. They're not comfortable, they're, they're, it's not in their armamentarium, right? They, they don't know, they don't feel, con they, don't, they just don't really know what to do with the, that, this particular drug. I mean, and, and to be fair, they don't use it. I mean, really. Um, initially, it was intended as a, as a pain management type of a drug, but it's really not used in that aspect, certainly not when it comes to surgical procedures. But what, what the um, sort of, what the recommendation is, really is to maintain buprenorphine perioperatively um, by and large. Um, and it doesn't mean for every single situation, but if they're, if they're going in and it's something that's planned and um, it's not you know, some kind of an enormous surgery, what we know is we can maintain them on their, their normal dose of buprenorphine, continue them on that dose just as you would as if they weren't having surgery so that every day they're taking their buprenorphine and then um, we can actually uh, um, add to their pain relief by using only new opioid receptor um, agonist medication. So that would, only, that would mean only morphine or typically um, fentanyl really in the hospital, especially for acute surgical procedures and um, uh, hydromorphone. So those would really be the only things that would be recommended to supplement um, if you're going to use opiates. Of course, there are other ways to supplement as well. I mean, you want to use um, uh, local anesthetics, you want to use blocks, you want to use um, 
uh, adjuncts like ibuprofen or, or Tylenol. I mean, these things can all be given even in IV form. I don't know if you're aware of that, but they can be given IV now, which is great. It's expensive, but it's great. So that if somebody is, um, you know, let's say they're having a, an operation on their belly and they're not allowed to take anything by mouth, even post-surgically, you can still think about giving these things through the IV, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> Um, and then this was interesting. It's just a recent protocol as well from Mass General, sort of how to manage uh, what to do with their buprenorphine for, for surgery. And you can see there that if it's just sort of a surgery and you're anticipating a mild pain, then you would just continue with the dose. Um, and then there are different things to do if you're anticipating moderate to severe pain. And depending on the dose, what you might think about doing. Um, this is sort of how they recommend proceeding. Um, and of course, some of the reason for that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic thing, right? So it's not that the buprenorphine is binding the receptor and, and that's it, right? It's sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining it's more of a dynamic, uh, you know, sort of effect, right? But, but what I guess is happening here and why they recommend tapering for bigger procedures is that you want those receptors to be available to, to receive some of the opioid uh, agonists that you're going to anticipate needing for really big procedures, you know, things that are maybe not amenable to, um, to regional anesthesia or epidurals, right? Because we do that a lot, certainly for big um, for economies. We know these are really painful surgeries. So oftentimes we'll, we'll um, recommend epidurals, but even with the epidural, and you may or may not be aware, but I, I know it because I, I used to do it. I'm an anesthesiologist, but we will put opioid in the continuous infusion for that thoracic epidural. So it'll be a combination of local anesthesia and opioid, typically like a fentanyl that'll be infusing. And so we want to have those receptors available to be able to, um, to you know, at least affect some good pain control. So that's one protocol from, from Mass General. Next slide. So then this was something that I thought was interesting. You know, can buprenorphine withdrawal be life-threatening, right? I mean, so we know that there are aspects of alcohol withdrawal that are, are, are certainly life-threatening and, you know, people need hospitalization for it. Is it true about buprenorphine? I mean, sometimes you might have somebody say, I can't, you know, I'm not gonna be able to, to stop my buprenorphine. It's gonna be, I, I'm just gonna die. And I thought to myself, is that, is that true? Is there any truth to that? And we know that you know, people do go to jail or to prison and um, they, they, are, they are withdrawn, right? So there's no, there's, there, a lot of times there's really no, no medical you know, withdrawal or, or help in that way. And um, you know, some people tell me uh, that I've seen so far, and it's anecdotal, but they'll say buprenorphine withdrawal is, is worse than heroin. It's just physically worse. I felt so bad when I just decided to stop myself that I just, I really wanted to die. And it's not, it doesn't seem to be an exaggeration. It seems to be really how people feel. And um, so, you know, is that something in and of itself that's risky? If somebody wants to die, are they willing to sort of then go the next step? Right, so that's sort of a question in my mind. And then if, it's, if, if you're anticipating withdrawal and it's untreated or if it's poorly treated, even if it's something that you're, you're managing uh, medically, um, you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to things that can happen, tachycardia, right, so rapid heartbeat, high blood pressure, um, they could lead to cardiac events, um, uh, vomiting and diarrhea, you think about how severe is it going to be, Will they be dehydrated, um, hypotensive? Are they going to aspirate? Um, esophageal tears, right, from, from vomiting, potentially. And then, like I had mentioned, you know, are people so, so um, miserable that they're going to attempt uh, suicide? Um, you know, I, I think I can imagine that that could be possible. Um, and then um, with, with, so some of the issues that are coming up now is that is it, is it cruel and unusual punishment when people go to jail and they are just detoxed? Is this considered something that's, you know, maybe that we're not going to um, accept anymore? Or maybe we need to do something about it. And I think there's something there um, and, and maybe we ought to think about how we, how we manage that in, in prisons. Um, and then um, some people have suggested that there's a role for this medication called um, sublocate. And, and this is just like a, a depot or a long-acting form of uh, buprenorphine. 
um, where, where it's, an, it's an injectable form so that, excuse me, as, as you're um, withdrawing, you could potentially, the idea is you could minimize some of those symptoms um, sort of, you know, longer term. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Oh, I've got, got a billion thoughts. Okay. Um, <laughs> Do tell. The, the, well, well, we were talking about this, uh, something that Alice had said earlier in terms of is there a role for um, anticonvulsants? And actually there is. Um, I forgot, it just it slipped my mind because I was thinking more of the emotional aspect of withdrawal. Uh, but the, the, the party line that I was always taught and that I teach the residents is um, opiate withdrawal will not kill you. Okay? You'll just feel like you're going to die. Um, unless you have other medical conditions where all of your withdrawal symptoms could indeed uh, cause you to have death due to those other conditions. So um, if you have uh, severe cardiomyopathy, um, you don't have great blood flow to your heart to begin with, uh, now we put you under the stressor of opiate withdrawal, we're going to develop a tachycardia. Um, uh, yes, you could end up with a heart attack. If you've got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that's fully controlled or an asthma that's not um, well controlled, yes, opiate withdrawal can cause you to have problems, not because of the opiate withdrawal, but because the effects it has on your other potentially life-threatening illnesses. Sacheal <clears throat> uh, Exactly. Um, or seizures. Okay, which is where Alice's question about the anticonvulsants comes in. Yep, um, if you've got somebody who's on, uh, who's got a history of seizures, optimizing their anticonvulsants um, before we take them through an untreated withdrawal um, it, uh, is, is wise. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, again, you're not going to die of opiate withdrawal, you're just going to feel like it, but you may die from other medical illnesses that are made worse temporarily due to your, due to your opiate withdrawal. Um, it, as far as what's worse and what's not, um, I, I think in some ways that's more a matter of taste uh, and probably has less to do with the drug and more to do with the biochemistry of the individual taking the drug uh, and what are their receptor subtype alleles uh, so that they would experience one drug uh, withdrawals worse than another drug. So it's not necessarily on the drug, it's on that particular individual. Because um, <clears throat> we do know, once again, in rat studies that um, rats will, and certain strains of rats will have certain preferences for certain types of opiates. Um, and we think that's probably a genetic thing. So um, it, it could well be that that's the same is true with withdrawal. Um, the, uh, the number of uh, completed suicides I've had in my practice, uh, knock on wood, has, has been rather limited, but two of them have been during withdrawal. Um, and, and one individual would not go back on methadone. Um, and uh, even though he was told, you really need to get back on methadone, he wouldn't do it, uh, and he went home and killed himself. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that can that type of thing can yeah, happen, but it's more a perceptual thing than it really is anything else. And if somebody's on a mm -hmm. antidepressant medication, mm -hmm. increasing that dose during withdrawal might be something that could do. I mean, it takes a little while to get... In, well, in my experience, that makes me feel better. I'm not so sure it really helps them feel better um, <clears throat> because there are so many things going on. Um, uh, SSRIs have not been shown to help with the hypofrontality um, of of chronic opiate use, and that's where your executive function is just shot. Your 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 ability to decision make and plan things, uh, and get uh, uh, the, the anhedonia, the emotional response, the goodies out of the things that you used to get out of life, um, is all shot. Uh, that they will describe as a depression. The SSRIs don't seem to help with that really, <clears throat> um, but. Optimizing it seems wise. Um, yeah, the old saying is "Couldn't wait." Do something <laughs> like that. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's my thoughts. On that. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. And and there's you know and and right. I mean, so the bottom line is, um, 
Yeah, right. So the withdrawal itself is no, but, right, so there are all these potential things that could happen and could lead to life-threatening events. Right. Just, you just got to know what their other medical conditions are sure, sure. Um, and, and watch them. Right. <clears throat> Uh, as far as uh, jail, prison is a cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, punishment in the eye, is in the eyes of the punisher. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of my patients will think that I'm punishing them because I have them in the hospital. Um, and it's only punishment if I'm keeping in the hospital because they don't like it. Now it's punishment. Um, uh, otherwise, it's considered therapeutic. I got to keep them there for a particular reason. Um, so I don't necessarily see it as punishment. However, um, uh, I think it's, it's relatively easy and simple to provide some basic withdrawal uh, parameters that could save their lives, like the use of quantity. Yeah. Um, keep their blood pressures low um, without keeping it too low. Um, and that will relieve um, about 25%, 25 to 30% of their withdrawal symptoms. Some say up to 80. I've never quite gotten into that. But then you can use other non-narcotic, relatively cheap medications, Imodium, composites, stuff like that. Um, so you could do it in, in jail or prison relatively cheaply and relatively easily. I mean, but my understanding is that's not what's happening now. I don't know. Is that true? Is Far Boulevard really... will treat you. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah, uh, the Washoe County oh, uh, Jail. Um, yes, they do have a protocol for, for coming oh, off uh, opiates. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, it's not bells and whistles. It's yeah, just yeah, basic yeah. stuff, but there you go. Right, right. So, oh, well, that's good. Okay, so there's some, there's the, some people are aware of this. It's yeah, crazy. it varies from area to area. Right, okay. And okay. usually if they're, if they're going into prison, they've been in jail already. So right. typically they're not detoxing <clears throat> when they get to prison, but in the jails more so. Well, it's easier to use in prison than it is in jail. <clears throat> so, um, and just the last, the, the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about is the, is the tapering and just some things to consider. And, and, and the first thing that, you know, um, is that really the, the very last stage of discontinuing the medication, it, you know, can be the most difficult I don't know that this is borne out in lots of research, but it's really overwhelming when you read information. Um, you know, that I'm finding on some of the, you know, the, the, the places where I go, ASAM and SAMHSA, um, and and you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, why is that? It just seems like the response when you taper from two milligrams and you try to go to zero, um, overwhelmingly, it seems that this is sort of this is more difficult and it's greater than any other time, even when the doses were started at much higher. And it's confusing. It's confusing for um, the <coughs> practitioner. It's confusing for the patient. People think, well, I've come this far. How hard could it be? You know, and I think it's important to sort of mentally prepare people for this and to also, um, you know, we don't typically give ourselves enough time to, or, or patients don't give themselves enough time to both mentally <coughs> and physically prepare for you know, if you think about being being sick or getting the flu, right? If you had influenza, nobody says, "Hey, you better just continue on with your day." I mean, so you would go home, you would you would quarantine yourself, you would spend time in bed, you know. And I think that it's important to sort of um, make sure you you frame it in the same way. It's going to be a similar kind of a thing. Um, and um, so I will also, and some have suggested that because they've had this extended period of abstinence. Um, right, so for basically from from heroin, and you know that maybe they've been on two or four milligrams for a year. Um, they're sort of not really mentally prepared or physically prepared for the discomfort of that withdrawal, and it will come. You know, it will be there, even though it's just a small amount. It's it's still going to be there, and they they need to be you know prepared for that. Um, and, and we know, we know that, the, you know, research has shown that there's, a, there's an incredibly high risk of relapse after discontinuing treatment. That's just, that's just the facts, you know. And so, um, uh, you know, it's important to consider at least transitioning to, to naltrexone and to also make sure people are aware that that's not, that doesn't stop anybody from using, right? It's just another tool. And, and it's not going to, to, to stop you from doing something, if, you know, that you, if, you're, if you're going to do it. 
Um, but but um, certainly medications, behavioral, environmental strategy, strategies are all really important to think about um, when you're at this point. And then also, you know, some people won't, it's not gonna happen. So they can remain on, you know, whether it's two milligrams or one milligram, whatever it might be, um, that's also an option. Um, that's something to sort of consider when you think about that pathway of we're decreasing the dose, we're, we're weaning off, or maybe we're not. Maybe that's not going to happen. You know, and that there may come a time when it's important to consider that in, in, this, in this path. Um, and, and really what you want to know is, um, you know, so what is full recovery, right? When have you determined that, hey, they're, they're recovered, things are great. I mean, some of the things that I, I think about are, you know, their, their symptoms are in remission um, and, and their life has changed maybe for the better. I mean, these are generalizations, but I guess what I try to challenge myself to do is think about um, is continuing on this medication or um, tapering the medication off, um, is this going to support their recovery, whatever that is for that particular person? You know, is it they can now continue um, to maintain their job and, you know, maintain their relationships, whatever that might be. Um, is that, is, is that, are those still things still holding true? Um, and I think if you can say yes to those things, that it may be they can continue on the medication. You know, is it indefinite? We don't like to say forever, but indefinitely. Um, and, and really the evidence shows that, that, you know, if they're maintained on the medication, um, they tend to do well. That's, that's what we know for sure. So I would like to point out, however, yeah. that there are no long-term studies of what happens with folks on buprenorphine over a 5, 10, 15-year period of time. They just aren't it. Uh, so when we say they do well, they're usually doing well over the type of one to two year time frames that these this is the longest these studies encompass. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, we can talk about how well are they doing and is good enough, good enough. Right. Um, uh, the other thing that practitioners, of course, have got to, to keep in mind is, are there some physiologic downsides to chronic exposure to opiates? Right. The answer is yes. Um, we do have to worry about um, bone density. We've got to worry about um, uh, effects on hormones. Um, uh, chronic constipation issues. Um, there are some long-term uh, downsides to um, chronic opiate use. Depression uh, rates are up in folks who are uh, using opiates. Um, the studies are a little hinky on that one because those are difficult to compare. Um, but certainly sleep patterns are, are, are much worse. Um, so there are, I mean, there are some effects of being on opiates long term. The question is, do those outweigh the benefits of remaining on the drug and the problems of trying to come off of it? Right, right, and I was actually <clears throat> gonna bring that up. I think it's a great point because I also feel concerned and some of my patients have been concerned with some of the um, endocrine, endocrine effects of the opiates. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't realize that these effects are long term. Um, uh, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary access, the gonadal access, I mean, these things are all affected. So the, um, the sex hormones, I mean, they are truly, um, you know, some of these long-term effects, you know, may not be reversible. And so um, it's really important to make sure people know that too. I mean, certainly if they're going to be maintained on, on uh, buprenorphine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, yeah risk-benefit, right? Low, low T issues, low yes, T issues yes. uh, came up as our opiate use also came up. Right. And, and, and I think there's, that, there's a correlation yes. there. Yes, <clears throat> people are so, so surprised that this would be, that, that this would be connected. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that they, they absolutely are. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's about all I've got. I, uh, I don't know if there's any questions or, any comments or, I know Dr. Kamyar sees lots of um, uh, interesting patients and has got a robust practice yeah. there in Las Vegas, so. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I guess overall, um, let's see. Um, okay, let me throw out some quotes from SAMHSA's 
tip 63. I guess that's their, I think that's their latest tip and tip okay. is treatment. I think it's called, I think it's short for treatment improvement protocol. They had a couple out there, 40 and 43 for a while, which were for MAT and buprenorphine. And now 63 is the latest, but I, I found these to be sort of really helpful and kind of guiding treatment length, duration, that sort of thing. One is uh, the goal of buprenorphine treatment is full remission from OUD. Uh, maintaining illicit opioid abstinence is ideal, but imperfect abstinence does not preclude treatment benefits. Patients should do better in treatment than before treatment. If not, seek an alternative. So that's kind of like a, you know, what to do, continue treatment, not con continue treatment. Should they taper off? Should they not taper off? It's just one sort of guiding principle. Um, another one is uh, do not judge treatment progress and success on the amount of medication a patient needs or how long treatment is required. Rather, gauge treatment progress and success based on patients' achievements of specific goals that were agreed on in a shared decision-making and treatment planning process. Um, and then given the often chronic nature of OUD and the potentially fatal consequences of unintended opioid overdose, it is critical that you base patients' length of time and treatment on their individual needs. Consider this analogy. A patient with poorly controlled diabetes was previously unable to work and was admitted to the hospital several times for diabetic ketoacidosis. When taking insulin regularly, the patient worked part-time, had fewer hospitalizations for diabetic ketoacidosis despite a non-diabetic diet and had lower but still high hemoglobin A1C. The patient's treatment with insulin is not a quote-unquote failure, um, because perfect control and function were not restored and the patient would not be discharged from care against his or her will. Um, I, so, you know, a lot of those things I, I often see is patients sort of work their way through different treatment programs, you know, being kicked out for positive UAs or some, you know, blips along the way. Um, and that kind of dovetails into duration of treatment, how long they should be on this stuff. But I, I mean, I think you guys have sort of covered everything. Um, I sort of uh, oftentimes base it on the first principle, which is, are they doing better in treatment than not in treatment? And I tend to view it, um, you know, treating addiction or use disorders, specifically like a substance use disorders, like I would in diet, like another chronic um, disease. So diabetes, hypertension. Um, and so if, you know, like you guys had mentioned, sort of the benefits, do they outweigh the risks um, or the cons? Um, if someone needs to be perpetually on something like MAT, buprenorphine, um, then so be it, just like how they might need to be on insulin for the rest of their lives. But if they can somehow manage with diet and exercise to get the A1C lower, and then we can taper them off of, let's say, metformin or some insulin, then that's how I sort of would view the, the, the buprenorphine side of things. Um, and then in the at actually how to do it i don't think any of the studies that are out there say definitively here's like a perfect protocol on how to do it um, they're all sort of different and so what i've what i often do is i um i think like dr broadhead had mentioned sort of long time frame like there is no rush to do this um and i want you to sort of be the captain of the ship and so yeah, if they're like a, you know, let's say 16 milligrams, then I just say shoot for, I, I basically shoot for half strips at a time, right? Until you get to that four milligram um, dose where things start to get a little murky. Um, and what I tend to do is, is that I will actually write them, I, I will write their prescription for their current dose, just in case they're not able to tolerate for whatever reason, so that they're not sort of left out there, you know, like if I go to down to 12 and write them a prescription for 12, but it doesn't work out, then, you know, what might happen? Um, but you can go, of course, you can go either way. Um, I, I would say it kind of gives them less sort of tolerance to increase dosage if you stick to that prescription. But anyhow, and then just letting them and then just checking, checking back in with them on whatever intervals you feel comfortable with one week, two weeks, um, see how they're doing. And if things are chugging along, um, and their withdrawals and cravings are uh, under control than holding steady or going down, um, like you guys had mentioned as well. Um, but yeah, finding difficulty, especially when it gets to those lower doses, I think being involved in therapy and counseling often helps um, when you're at the four, two, one, half milligram doses. 
Um, and then there, then there's also the, the transitioning to naltrexone as sort of long, long term, um, depending on what the patient's preference is or what their motivations are for coming off of, uh, off of suboxone or, or buprenorphine. Um, I find that a lot of times because, I mean, this is all, I, I would say my, my experience with patients are relatively new. Um, so I haven't had patients who I've seen for 10 years who have been on it. Um, and so a lot of the patients that I have who are considering coming off, who, who, who want to come off, it's usually stigma related. It's usually like my family or my significant other says that I'm still addicted to a medicine. And so I'm finding that I spend a lot of time sort of discussing about, you know, that substance use disorder is sort of a chronic disease of the brain. We treat it like we would diabetes. And then they go back with sort of that in their toolkit to discuss with the significant other or family, or I have those people come into the appointments with them if the patient is comfortable. And, you know, that little, that little bit can sometimes, you know, set that, that seed a change. And then the, the plan might change. They no longer want to, you know, taper off the medication. Um, but now here in Vegas, it's all pregnancy related. Uh, so we see a, a, a lot of people who are more motivated to come off uh, during their pregnancies because of the, um, the neonatal abstinence withdrawal syndrome. However, um, there is no guarantee that just because you come off, you're, 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 the baby's not going to have NAS. So then oftentimes when people hear that, then that sort of you know, muddies the waters again. Motivation levels don't necessarily you know, remain as high as they, as they were going into it, not knowing that people think that if they're off of it completely, by the time they deliver, then baby's in the clear and there won't be any issues, but that that's just simply not, not how it works. Um, so I don't know, I guess, I guess that's kind of my, my soapbox for the end of it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Any other questions before we wrap up for the day? Well, if I could just, something that Dr. Kamier kind of highlighted and we've all said, but you know, we didn't really put a fine point on it is, um, all of us I think in some way have said, and if people are having trouble coming off of it, uh, the, the drug, you increase their treatment. That doesn't mean you necessarily increase their drug. So you may see them more often, you, you, know, you get them into more therapy. Um, so, you're, you're still treating them um, and you're still doing treatment. It's just you're kind of changing your, 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 how you're going to, how you're going about treating them. Um, uh, because it, it, it hit me again, I'm stupid here. Um, you guys are generally seeing folks um, a lot less often than I am because I'm working in a VA system. Um, I can see them a lot more frequently. And so I do. Uh, and that's one of the things I'll always do. If you're coming off, um, the medication, I will see you more frequently. You're on a much more frequent schedule, no more than every um, couple of weeks. Um, so we can make little smaller changes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Cameo. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions or comments or um, don't be shy. Um, really quick, yes. really quick before we go, um, this is Carol's last oh, echo oh. with us. Carol is leaving hopes to go to the VA. Um, <laughs> going into general surgery, so something that totally is. Something different. Um, but how long have you been doing that now? Um, for about a year, um, two years. Uh, year about a year and nine months. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's been really um, fun. Yeah. Encourage everyone to try and get out there and get more people interested in obtaining their waiver because mm -hmm. the need is so great. I feel I feel a lot of um, hesitancy giving up on this program because it's just a great program. But you know, I'm getting sort of where I have to think about retirement. <laughs> I hate to, but <laughs> yeah. So that's my big um, impetus. But it's been really a pleasure. It's it's so nice mm -hmm. to work with all of you. Yes. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Thanks. We're going to miss you. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll be back in uh, two weeks. That'll be January 23rd. So hope to see you all then. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.